Now, a study suggests that more than a quarter of men think telling sexual jokes and stories at work is acceptable. A survey of more than 20,000 people in 27 countries has been carried out to mark International Women's Day. The figures for Britain are similar and show that British men are much more accepting of sexual banter than their counterparts in countries like the US, Mexico and Australia. In a moment, we'll speak to the former Australian Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, about this. But first, here's a reminder of how she called out sexist behaviour in the Australian Parliament in 2012 when she described the opposition's Tony Abbott as a misogynist. I will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. I will not. And the government will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. Not now, not ever. The Leader of the Opposition says that people who hold sexist views and who are misogynists are not appropriate for high office. Well, I hope the Leader of the Opposition has got a piece of paper and he is writing out his resignation. Because if he wants to know what misogyny looks like in modern Australia, he doesn't need a motion in the House of Representatives. He needs a mirror. And Julia Gillard, who just saw... Jan joins us now. Um, a very memorable moment from your time in Parliament there. Um, talk to us about this report carried out by the Global Institute for Women's Leadership and Ipsos Mori and its key findings. Well, this report is really pointing to toxic work cultures and the vast majority of people are, of course, not buying into this, but unfortunately, sizable minorities still are. So you've cited some of the findings. It's around one men in three who think that it's OK to tell a joke that has sexual content at work. It's around one men in 10 who think it's OK uh, to put up a poster or some other form of display that has a sexual image. Uh, those proportions vary country by country. But I think a lot of us would have assumed before this survey that after decades of talking about gender equality and particularly after the Me Too movement, that it would be better than this. And so it does reinforce the need for employers uh, to step up in terms of shaping workplace cultures and making sure that they're inclusive and respectful of everyone. So it suggests, doesn't it, despite uh, the developments of the last couple of years in particular, you cite the Me Too movement, that culturally um, there is still an enormous shift that needs to take place. There is more to do. I mean, this same survey uh, asks men and women about whether or not they would stand up if there was a sexist remark or sexist conduct. And overwhelmingly, men and women say that they would. Interestingly, in the UK, more men and women say that they would. They say they particularly would uh, in their family and friendship group. But a sizable number also say they would at work, even with a colleague who was quite senior. So we are seeing some progress, some willingness to address these kinds of cultures and the barriers that hold women back. But when we've got numbers that show that there are still sizable minorities who think that very discriminatory conduct is OK, there is much more to do by employers and by all of us. What are the key things that you would like to see employers do who aren't already putting strategies in place to deal with this sort of behaviour? Well, we certainly think it's important for employers to get on the front foot. I mean, I think what many employers have done, particularly in the wake of Me Too, is that they've set in place complaints procedures and the like so people can raise poor conduct. And that's good. There should be a way of people being able to say at work that something has happened and it needs to be corrected. But we're really asking out of these survey findings for employers to go the next step and have a proactive approach, uh, looking at their workplace culture, uh, talking to staff about how to make sure relationships at work are respectful. So rather than waiting for when something's gone wrong and then using a process to try and address it, actually be building a culture that's inclusive of all right from the start. I noticed in the survey, it's really interesting that the data shows that people feel women's careers are significantly more at risk than men's if they turn down, it says, for example, a romantic advance, if they talk about their family life or don't take part in social activities with colleagues. Um, tell us more about that, because that seems 
oh, you know, on, on top of the, the inappropriate comments, the sexist comments largely directed towards women, then women are suffering more on this front as well. That's true. And I actually think when we look at that section of the survey that people are reporting what is their lived reality, we do know that there are continuing to be many structural barriers for women at work. Uh, so workplaces where part of being on the network, in the in-group, getting the next opportunity for promotion is about socialising after hours, which is often harder for women to do because they disproportionately take the load when it comes to childcare care and other forms of domestic work in the home. I think people are also responding to lived experiences when they know that it can cost a woman at work if she rejects an advance from a colleague or a superior or if she's seen to complain about that kind of conduct. And over many generations now, I think people have seen that if men talk about their families at work, that enhances their status. They're seen to be safe and stable, a family man. Whereas if a woman talks about her family at work, she's seen to not have her mind on the job. Uh, so these barriers are still there for women. What we do at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership here at King's College is we try and shine a light on exactly these kinds of barriers and then amass the evidence about what's the best thing to clear them out of the way and to make sure that progress for women is truly fair. Uh, each country, of course, has to effectively put its own house in order. Uh, I just wonder, given that we began our conversation by looking at that clip of you calling out misogyny in Australian politics, how you think Australia is doing. Coincidentally, I read a story yesterday about a Melbourne newspaper cancelling all its reader commentary on its coverage of Australian Football League uh, League's women's competition because of vile and sexist posts directed towards those women players. So how is Australia doing? Well, we've got to do uh, much better. Uh, the World Economic Forum every year puts out rankings of gender equality and Australia has slipped in those rankings. We've gone down to number 44. Uh, our near neighbours in New Zealand are at number six. So that's a challenge for us. Australians and New Zealanders tend to be pretty competitive on the sporting field. So I hope that that spurs us to more action in Australia for gender equality. But when it comes to the kind of vile stuff that can be on social media, um, that's not just Australia. We know that that happens right around the world. Uh, it's a challenge for women who are in the public square, who are in politics. And we saw a lot of that play out in the lead up to the last UK election, where a number of very senior women uh, who could have gone uh, in, on in their political careers to uh, ever more higher office actually chose to exit politics many of them citing uh, the fact that they were um, over having their day punctuated by very violent and revolting remarks on social media. So I think this is a shared challenge right around the world. Julia Gillard, former Prime Minister of Australia, thank you very much for your time today. Great to have you on the programme. Thank you so much.